when you were talking about the you know the, the the idea that a single guy starts this and then other people realize that they had the same problem i couldn't help but think yeah so like a single guy hates version four of whatever uh desktop environment it is and then mm-hmm. finds out that oh there's other people that hate version four of this and they will stay on version three forever yeah yeah that 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 did happen didn't it <laughs> more than once i believe yeah, I, look, you can say that, but I'm thinking, like, there's there's definitely more than one. Sometimes it's not even version 4, sometimes it's version 3, and then they diverge mm-hmm. from there. Mm-hmm. That's where several desktops came from. Mm-hmm. Like, both both uh, KDE and GNOME, there's, like, there's so there's Trinity, which is the fork of KDE 3. Mm-hmm. I think there's one that's the fork of, of KDE 2. There's a couple of them that are forks of early GNOME, maybe, maybe GNOME 3, I think... Cinnamon, maybe one of those. I I can't remember for sure off the top of my head, but there's multiple stories. Of those. I, I think I think Trinity is three because that's where the no, three um, Trinity comes cinnamon, from. Sorry, C- no, no, oh, cinnamon. Not Trinity. Cinnamon, cinnamon, maybe maybe KDE two. I I, I honestly I I don't run cinnamon. I've yeah, never sure. run cinnamon, so I don't know. No, they're definitely not using it. Uh, GTK two now, but I I think they might have diverged then. I don't know. It doesn't. Yeah. yeah probably. And, and so that's that's actually pretty interesting. You've got these guys, they'll, these projects, they'll start with something like that. Like, they'll start with the KDE2 code base. Mm-hmm. They don't leave it there. It does not stay KDF, you know, it's not a rebrand of KDE2 forever. They actually mm-hmm. go and do something with it, which is really pretty fascinating. Yeah, that's one of the things about, like, when a big project gets forked. Because you'll see this with, uh, a good example is the emulators that were taken down by Nintendo. All of a sudden mm-hmm. you see forks that appeared where it was like oh it's the project but we renamed some strings oh it's the project Mm -hmm. we made a minor ui change (laughs) when you have a project that's that complex making Mm -hmm. an actual fork is really difficult and there actually was a very recent example of a fork that does have some legitimate developer backing um the Flutter project from Google got forked into another toolkit called Flock. This ha- like just happened like a day ago. Um, and there's some ex-Flutter developers who are working on the project. So they actually have that knowledge of the code base to be able to go and do so. Yeah, well, it's real, it is real fascinating to see sort of throughout history, the history of forks. Because there have been some very big projects that have forked. Um, X11 or and, a- Xorg. And- well, so Xorg is one of GCC. GCC forked way back in the day. Mm-hmm. And what happened there is the fork became the next version of GCC. So what was happening is the 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 devs in charge of GCC, and this is this is ancient times, man. This is I have not ago heard now. this story before. The 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 devs in charge of GCC were moving very slow, and there were some essentially young upstarts that said, Hey, let's move fast to break things. You know, they were the, the Elon Musk of GCC. Mm-hmm. And uh, they they forked it. And started working on it, and the, the old graybeards were like, this code is actually pretty good. And so they all got back together, and they said, okay, we're going to take your fork of it, and that's going to be GCC next. Hmm. And uh, you had something similar happen with OpenWRT. I was actually there for this one. Um, OpenWRT got forked, and uh, LEAD, L-E-D-E, which I don't remember what that stands for. Something Linux embedded development, something, something. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, and you, OpenWRT gets forked, right? Like, that happens a lot. It's a popular project. Sure. Um, and people are opinionated, so it gets forked. And so, you know, the mailing list message got message got posted to the mailing list. We're mm-hmm. forking OpenWRT. And at first, like, oh, yawn, yeah, another fork. Okay. And then I saw some of the names involved in it. I'm like, wait a second. I sent that guy hardware, and he ported my hardware. I've worked with that guy. That guy, and started looking at it. It's like, this is a lot of people from the project. These are important people that forked it. And so you had the two, the two different forks of OpenWRT that lasted for... About a year, a year and a half, somewhere around there. And then they did the same thing. It's like, ah, you know what? Let's, let's merge the streams back together. And they took, uh, they took the lead code base and it replaced it and it became OpenWRT. Mm-hmm. So like, there's some fascinating stuff that happens with forks and their resolutions. Yeah, Xorg is another very interesting story because that was a, like, X386 had been around for quite a while. Like, people were just happy on X386. They were just doing their mm-hmm. thing. And then it was around, I think, like, 2003 2004 there was some interest in changing the license from something that was gpl compatible over to i think it was their own like custom internal license i can't remember the exact terms of it but a lot of people came out and were like this is not compatible with the gpl obviously it was like they they didn't start gpl anyway but like the the whole idea at the time is the, the the interest in free software and gpl back in the early 2000s is a lot more 
I guess, vibrant, a lot more enthusiastic than it is now, right? Mm. Uh, there's a lot more people now who are in favor of the more, like, open source side, like MIT code, Apache code, things like that. Uh, for, for better or worse, that's just the way it is, because there's a lot of developers who make libraries mm-hmm. and stuff who are very uh, big fans of that. Um, there was interest in, like, changing the license. A lot of people were just not happy about that. And then, like, major developers on the project started getting banned after, like, talking about, like how that was a bad thing and there was push to fork it and like originally the plan with with Excel wasn't even just like it wasn't even to fork oh. the project it was just a discussion area to talk about like issues with the X11 environment and eventually enough people got fed up with the way the project was being run and it became this whole fork of the project that at least for a couple of years became, like, the the main thing before, like, Wayland came along and that started having developers move mm-hmm. into that. Mm-hmm. But, like, I, I really like the history of a lot of these FOSS projects. Because there's, there's so much... So, there's so much just internal so, politics. <laughs> oh, yes. So, X386, I'm not familiar with this story. Mm-hmm. Uh, X386 banned several of their developers. And mm-hmm. as a result, the fork was made. And then the fork is what we have now. So... There's this saying that I really like. History doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm sure a lot of your listeners do, too. There have been, uh, we're, we have seen some projects here in the past couple of months. I, I guess longer than that, but I've really been looking at it for a couple of months now. Mm-hmm. Something will happen, and they'll go on, you know, a banning spree. They'll they'll get rid of all the t- get rid of all the toxic people or or what have you. Um, I I already I got myself in trouble earlier in the week uh, talking about toxicity in the GNOME community. Um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, so when I when on like on ULS when I talk about this kind of stuff, I I almost always preface it with a deep sigh. And then, guys, I don't want to be talking about this. I would like to be talking about the wins of open source. Mm. I would like to be talking about how cool Rust is and Wayland. We got HDR working, and there's a new version of the kernel. But no, we have to talk about the dumb politics and culture war stuff that somehow has made its way into our hobby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hate it. I, yeah. I just wish we could write cool code. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Like, when I... when I, uh, I haven't been involved in Linux and FOSS anywhere near as, as long as you have, and I do kind of want to talk about sort of what you feel like have been like big changes over the years but mm. when i when i started using it it was uh just before covid yeah yeah j- like maybe a year before that um <clears throat> and maybe two years i don't know anyway not not too long before that that's that's my my basis for time right now uh <laughs> but back then uh, i i do feel like there was a lot more focus on obviously Every project has their internal politics and all that sort of stuff. Sure, whatever. But there definitely seemed to be a lot more focus on just working on projects, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, 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 I could blame the Fediverse and Mastodon popping up and people using it as like their, <laughs> their, their, their like day diary to like rant about other projects. But I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure it's not just one thing. Actually, this yeah, is, sure. This blame, is, blame the Fediverse. Yeah, that'll get us all. Yeah. That's how you win friends and influence people, Brody. This is actually a really fun talk. <laughs> I, I see. It, may, maybe I just wasn't paying attention because there's actually there's a talk by uh, by Dirk Hondel, um ten years ago, talking about why he was moving a project from GTK over to Qt, and all of the issues that he brought up are the same issues with, that we talk about today. It's like um the project being focused on the things that they want to work on not being interested in like outside uh discussion the the documentation not lining up and uh it's being blamed as a developer problem or like the, the lack of it enth- <laughs> like, if there's a problem the cute community has a lot of enthusiasm to help you fix the problem whereas gtk like you need to like they, they want you to just go and do it yourself like i don't know <laughs> As I said, I already got myself in trouble earlier this week talking about some things never change. Some yeah. things never change. Yeah, I mean, developers developers generally don't like writing documentation. Oh, and I so get there it. Is, yeah, is there is like this legitimate thing? So if you've got if you have people in your project that's excited about documentation that actually want to take ownership of that and do it, it's so nice. It's great. 
not every project has that. And so, you know, different projects have different levels of documentation. And sometimes the documentation is, well, here's, here's the header file. Like, legitimately, there's a lot of libraries. That is what a lot of Rust Here's the, here's the header file. Yeah. Uh, sometimes like, it works. It does, yeah. Sometimes it, sometimes it works. If you're talking about a simple library and you have some documentation strings in your header file, like, that can legitimately be all that you need. But not always. 